So today we have our speaker, Brad LaFortune. Brad has worked most of his life on Treaty 6 in Alberta as an advocate for workers' rights and social and economic environmental justice. Before becoming an executive director at Public Interest Alberta, Brad served as the chief of staff to the Minister of Labor for the Alberta NDP government and has helped to implement the $15 minimum wage and set up North America's first coal, coal workforce transition fund. Today, Brad will be discussing the specifics of the CPP and how it works, and he'll also discuss what civil society, businesses, seniors, and many Albertans are doing to come together to make the sure, sh sure the CPP is there for all Albertans and all Canadians for generations to come. So please welcome and joining Brad. Well, do you, you know, join me in welcome. Thanks, Christy. All right, can everyone hear me okay at the back? More or less? Okay, this is great. This is the biggest crowd that I've talked to in like three years, so I'm a little bit nervous. This is fantastic. It's really nice to be here in Lethbridge. I'm from Edmonton, um, and uh, I work uh, as the executive director of an organization called Public Interest Alberta. Uh, before I get started, um, we're obviously here to talk about CPP today, but I want to talk a little bit about myself and acknowledge that I'm here on you know Blackfoot territories and lands that are really sacred to the Métis people as well, mm -hmm. and we really take that seriously at Public Interest Alberta, and I want to thank SACPA for all the work that they do in the community as well and for inviting me here today and for Christy doing a great job in the new chair role. Congratulations, Christy. That's fantastic. Um, I, uh, I missed Halloween by a couple days in Lethbridge, but my daughter and I dressed up as the spookiest things we could imagine. So I went as AIM Co. <laughs> And, and, my, and my daughter went as the Alberta Pension Plan. And we were, we were looking for, you know, between two and $334 billion from people at the door. It didn't go over very well, but it was pretty scary. Um, so um, I just uh, thank you for acknowledging my uh, terrible sense of humor. Um, so Public Interest Alberta is a 20-year-old organization. We're in our 20th year now. We're an advocacy-based organization. We're a not-for-profit, um, but we're, we're strictly nonpartisan. But we sometimes get lumped into the progressive side of things when it comes to politics, because we believe in strong public services, strong public institutions, and also how we fund them. So we talk a lot about financial reform, fiscal reform, and public services, from healthcare to education, seniors care, environment, and other issues like that. One of the issues that's very important to us right now, obviously, is the Canada Pension Plan. Um, it's been the talk of the province and now the country for the past several months. And so we've been focusing on uh, developing a campaign, which we've been working on for the last two months, um, to really raise awareness and educate Albertans about the importance of the pension plan, the Canada Pension Plan, how it works, how it's structured, um, and also to talk about the the LifeWorks report. I don't know if anybody slogged through the whole thing. Um, I, I had to for work. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, um, but there is a pretty good executive summary to just get a sense of where the, the government's coming from. Um, so, you know, just before we get going though on the Canada Pension Plan, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that when it comes to advocacy, um, our philosophy at PIA is that it's for everyone. It's for me, it's for you, it's for everyone in their community to have conversations about the things that matter to them. We currently have a provincial government that is very convinced that because they eked out a narrow majority, and they have the majority of seats in the legislature, that they basically can do whatever they want. Even though during the election, you'll remember if you're paying attention, like many of us were, that Daniel Smith did not really want to talk about this EPP. She wanted to talk about it after the election. So that's what we're doing now. And unfortunately, Albertans didn't really have a lot of information on the question of retirement security. And, you know, as we all know, there's three p pillars of retirement security in, in Canada, CPP being the first pillar. It's been around for decades, it'll be around for decades to come, and it's very safe, secure, reliable, and efficient. So we wanted to be talking about that during the election. We didn't really get the chance to do it, so that's why we're here today. I was at the throne speech in Edmonton the other day. I don't know if anybody tuned in here. Did anybody watch the throne speech? Don't, don't blame you for not tuning in, that's okay. Um, the government didn't even talk about pensions. It wasn't mentioned once. But there's pension legislation on the order paper that could be introduced as soon as you know, next week or the week after in, in, in the legislature. So this is a very important, critical, timely topic to be, to be talking about right now. Um, so um, what's our mission at PIA? Essentially, it's a, it's a fair Alberta for all. 
Um, we believe in collective power. We believe in organizing with our allies, allies like SACPA and all of you. And we also believe that we need to make sure that we're working together to educate and mobilize Albertans for democratic change. And that doesn't mean just every four years at the ballot box, but it means having town halls like this one. It also means organizing campaigns, whether it's online or in person, rallies, meeting with your MLAs, and empowering people to, you know, sometimes take the step for the first time to go meet with fancy elected officials like Shannon Phillips, for example. Um, I think Shannon's mom is here because she delivered some uh, petitions. Thank you very much, Barb. Um, but what we like to say is that, you know, politicians are just like the rest of us. They're elected to do a job and that's to represent us. So at PIA, what we try to do is give people the tools to use um, to affect change through decision makers. And we focus on the provincial level. Our other big priority other than CPP, just as you know, by way of passing, is that I'm not sure um, how many of you all are working in the housing sector or are familiar with the housing sector, but social public housing and housing security is, number, is, is our number two issue right now. So if you're interested in public interest Alberta from a housing perspective as well as CPP, I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, we're living through a housing crisis, quite frankly, in this province right now. It affects every single corner of the province as well as Lethbridge. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, the province is, is really not showing up to the table when it comes to this issue. So, CPP under threat, and how can we save it? Like I said, um, at Public Interest Alberta, our vision is in Alberta for all. Our purpose is to bring people together and give them the tools they need to create change. And our goal is to make sure that people like ourselves are represented in the halls of power. Some of you may have heard of Take Back Alberta. Um, show of hands, have you heard of Take Back Alberta? Yeah. Um, I'm not a big fan. <laughs> I believe in social democracy, I believe in democratic engagement, and I believe that people should be able to influence decision makers throughout their term in office. So we believe in democratic engagement. I don't think populism is a dirty word in itself, but the kind of populism that we're seeing take hold in Alberta today in our communities, especially in rural and remote communities in smaller cities, is very, very, very concerning and dangerous. It's dangerous for teachers, it's dangerous for kids, it's dangerous for average working Albertans who are unionized or not. And so what we're trying to do at PA is offer an alternative vision and an alternative vehicle to mobilizing people and building collective power to build an Alberta that will work for everyone. So. That's some, some a bit of background about our vision, purpose, and goals. Um, when it comes to the CPP and why we wanted to talk about it is quite simply, it's in the public interest. The CPP is there for all workers. We all pay the same contribution rate. We all receive the same benefits as workers. It doesn't matter if you're Albertan. It doesn't matter if you're from Ontario. It doesn't matter where you're from, except for Quebec, but we'll talk about that. And that's their choice. They didn't enter the CPP, as we know. Um, it's also about democracy. Um, when you look at the CPP, it is a democratic issue. The CPP is independent from government. Um, their board is responsible for making the best investments to maximize returns um, for Canadians to secure the long-term uh, uh, viability of the Canada Pension Plan. They don't make investment decisions based on politics. They don't make investment decisions based on geography, investing in Alberta or Ontario, or picking winners and losers. Their sole purpose is to invest in the CPP so that it'll be there and healthy and strong for all of us as Canadians. That's very different than what we're hearing from the Alberta government when it comes to the Alberta Pension Plan, but we'll talk about that more. So it's a democratic issue as well. It's also about equity and fairness. Um, the chief actuarial um, and the government of Alberta, or government of Canada rather, in the late 90s knew that the CPP was in a little bit of trouble Right? And so what they did is they sat down and worked with the provinces to come up with a solution to make sure that it's sustainable for the next 75 years and beyond, um, and that it's going to remain equitable and fair and accessible for all workers. And it's not just a seniors issue. I'm looking around the room here and I'm noticing that I may be a little bit younger than the average age. Um, but when I talk to workers who are around my age, middle of their career, just kind of starting to think about retirement security a little bit more seriously, they know that the CPP is a very important pillar of their retirement security. And I have, you know, 25-ish years to go, so I got a long way ahead of me at work, but I know that the CPP needs to be there for me, and so many people don't have um, employer pension plans. Um, a lot of people who are lucky enough to have them, obviously that's another pillar for folks, but right now a lot of people are investing 
accessing an RSPs on their own or nothing at all, right? Old age security might be another option that they're looking to depending on their circumstances, but CPP is really that really strong foundation and pillar that's always gonna be there for folks no matter what. We also are really concerned about it from the perspective of, of uncertainty and risk posed by an Alberta pension plan. You'll often hear people say that, well, the CPP is not gonna be around forever. Um, well, maybe, maybe not, forever is a long time, but if you trust the chief actuarial of the CPP and the government of Canada and experts who have been looking at the CPP for a long time, it's healthy and sustainable for at least 75 years. Um, and that's with population growth projections, that's with demographic, you know, uh, age projections, that's everything included. Um, and so when you talk about, you know, creating a new pension plan in global markets, you really have to think about um, how, how big that plan's gonna be and how it can take in volatility, of course, right? So we're talking about, there's a debate about the number of what we might be uh, um, able to access. Um, there's a big number the government put out, there's a smaller number that other people are talking about, but at the end of the day, it's still gonna be much, much smaller than the Canada Pension Plan, and therefore it would include much more risk and uncertainty, uncertainty in volatile global markets. So that's why we care about it quite a lot. Um, so how does the CPP work? So um, the CPP was established as a pay-as-you-go plan. So it's different than you know, multi-employer pension plans. Um, it's paid half and half by employers and employees, as we know. Um, and it's legislated up to a contribution rate of 9.9% between those two parties. Um, currently, it's a little bit lower than that, but they give themselves a little bit of buffer room um, to raise the rate up to 9.9%. And that's important because when you hear the Alberta government talking about lower contribution rates and higher, um, higher benefits, um, if you look at comparable plans that we could look at, like the Quebec pension plan, for example, currently Quebec has higher contribution rates than the CPP. That could change over time, but when the QPP was established in the mid 60s, um, what we saw was um, a really young population and it was a time when the CPP was being established as well, so the market was more open to pension plans um, in similar environments, um, and their contribution rates have risen over time as a result of demographic uh, changes. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, and you know, I'm just going to go over some you know maybe technical details as well um, to talk about how it works. So PAYGO plans are, are, are funded by contributions from the salaries of those currently employed, and then that money is used to pay those who are no longer employed and are retired and are beneficiaries of the plan. So as workers pay into the plan, they also accrue benefits they'll be paid when they retire. So essentially, each generation funds the income of the previous generations, uh, funds the retirement of the previous generation while they're working. So this is normal for universal public pension plans in North America and Europe. As I said, contributions are paid half and half by employers and employees. Um, and this is really important as well when you talk about the, the year's maximum pensionable earnings. Currently, CPP is at 25%. So again, not enough really to get people by, but it is an important pillar and it's gonna be improved over time to 33% of that yearly maximal, maximum uh, 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 pensionable earnings. So that would be 2022 numbers, $64,900. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about history, <laughs> just very briefly. So in 1997, as I mentioned, the provinces and federal government agreed on measures to prevent funding shortfalls and unsustainable contribution rates. Over the next uh, few years from there, the total contribution rates rose to 9.9%, and this is currently higher than what is projected today to fund the plan um, based on uh, current projections. So contributions above those required to fund pensions being paid right now go into an investment fund and the proceeds of the investment fund are partially paid or partially fund future pension benefits. Um, according to uh, the chief actuarial of, actuary of Canada, and it's been reviewed by independent actuaries as well, so there's that sort of, you know, um, uh, independent analysis on top of the chief actuary, the added income from the investment funds should mean that contribution rates will remain steady at their current le uh, level for decades to come. And I'll show you guys a little bit of information later until 2050 and then also 75 years out, they should remain um, level for that, that timeline horizon, which is good news. Um, talked a bit about that. So 
I just wanted to show you a visualization of the financial stability uh, or sustainability of the CPP. Um, the, the, the words are a bit small there, uh, but you can see um, it goes from 2022 to 2050, and you can see projected assets and then actual assets, which are calculated every year uh, for for the previous year. And you can see that you know actually in the last couple of years, for the actuals, we're performing better than what's being projected. And this projection is available on the CPP Investment Board website, and they have a lot of really good information as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about benefits. Um, the Canada Pension Plan has been delivering pension benefits to Canadians for over five decades, almost 60 years. Uh, the plan has proven itself to be reliable, efficient, and dependable. In 2016, the same governments, uh, provincial and federal, agreed on future improvements to CPP benefits. These benefits will rise over time until they cover 33 instead of 25% of earnings, and the level of earnings covered will rise above the average industrial wage. This means better pension benefits for future generations. The CPP also has two important features that are important for us to think about when we think about it in contrast to an Alberta pension plan. One is portability. You can take it with you to other provinces. You can also take it with you when you change jobs. You, you, know, you pay the same contribution rates whether you're employed by you know, uh, Health Canada or you're employed by the city of Lethbridge. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what province you're working in. Um, and you also continue to accrue benefits at the same rate, of course, as you pay into the plan. Um, the other important thing that's really exciting, especially when you think about um, all of the conversations that we've had over the last few, few years about inflation, is that CPP benefits are in indexed to inflation. They don't erode over time in terms of your earning power and what you receive. And we've just come through a period of very, very high inflation. Um, and so that really kind of underlines for me the, the, the danger when, when pensions aren't indexed to inflation because you know our money just doesn't go as far as it used to. Um, I'm going to talk about politics a little bit because <laughs> I talk about it all the time. Um, there's no politics in the CPP. I mean, there's politics in this conversation right now, but within the structure of the plan itself, there are no politicians. The board is completely independent from government. Um, and when it comes to the terms of reference uh, for the investment board and their responsibility to the plan members, me and all of you and all of us in Canada, is that they make investment decisions to maximize the health of the plan, and that's it. They're not making political decisions. They're not making decisions about, you know, know whether to pick projects that are here or there or might you know secure Alberta's economic future through a pipeline or some of sort of other infrastructure um, so the directors are completely independent the investment teams make decisions based on the CPP's mandate which I said is really about maximizing returns for Canadians and the act in terms of reference reinforce that and they're they're bound by that so it's very clear um, as of December 31st uh, the CPP investment fund amounted to 536 billion dollars the directors of the CPP investments are completely independent from government, as I mentioned. And, you know, those numbers are really as a result of that independence and making decisions that are in the best interests of uh, contributors and not uh, politically motivated. Um, uh, the answer to that question, what could possibly go wrong in Smith's Alberta Pension Plan, is quite a lot of things could go wrong. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, she wouldn't discuss it during the spring 2023 election. Um, didn't want to. She was asked a few times, but said, you know, we'll, we'll have lots of time to talk about that um, when the report is released. So when the report was released, I remember I had a few conversations with, with some folks in Lethbridge and Trevor Toom in Calgary and, and others who just were all on the phone and were like, are we reading the same number here? Is this really happening? We're, they're saying that we're going to pull out 53% of the total asset pool of the CPP. And everyone's scratching their heads. I'm like, yeah, no, that's what we're seeing here. Um, so if you've read the report or if you've heard the coverage, which I'm sure you have by now, LifeWorks, formerly Morneau Chap Chappelle, um, came up with what they called themselves an alternative interpretation of the asset transfer clauses within the Canada Pension Plan Act. So those clauses haven't been updated for a couple of decades. Um, they've been basically the same for a long time, and they are open to interpretation, like any legislation. The problem with that is that alternative legislation or interpre interpretation of the legislation means that um, they delivered a report to the Alberta government. We're told that it was the full report and it hadn't been changed, although who knows, they took a long time to release it. <laughs> um, that said that we're 
we're able to access $334 billion um, in the asset transfer. And so that number is concerning, concerning for a number of reasons. Um, it's been panned across the country. Um, hi. Yes, I sure can. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'll, I'll try to speak a little bit louder. Um, so it's been panned across the country. I'd also encourage you right now, if you haven't looked already, there is a publicly available report from the Ministry of Finance within the Alberta government that was delivered to the previous finance minister that said we might be eligible to about 12 to 16 percent of the total asset pool um, from the government of Canada to create our own pension plan, which is much less than 53 percent. Um, and more in line with what Trevor Toome and other pension experts have said, we might be eligible to receive if we chose to leave the plan. Um, on this question though, it's possible, I just want to pause and say, it's, we're allowed to leave the plan. If you look at the Canada Pension Plan Act, it's very clear. You have to create a comparable pension plan with comparable benefits and contribution rates for your provincial residents, um, and it has to have the same basic features, but you're allowed to do it. Uh, Quebec just chose not to enter it. It has basically the same plan, although they make different financial decisions based on their legislation, but essentially it has similar benefits. Contribution rates are a little bit higher. So we are allowed to do it, but this report is very, very misleading for a number of reasons. Number one is that the amount that they say that we're eligible to is, I believe, very misleading and and um, wrong, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, the next is, you know, when they're engaging Albertans, and this is what I do every day is we talk to Albertans and try to like get their, their sense of how they feel and things in the act is the survey, uh, I don't know if you've taken the survey, um, I did. I, the, the first question wasn't what, wasn't do you want an Alberta pension plan? It was almost a foregone conclusion. It felt like a push-pull in a survey that wasn't really in good faith, right? So they didn't ask us if we actually want the Alberta Pension Plan. They just kind of assumed, you know, it's going to happen. So what do you want it to look like? Do you like getting more benefits? Would you like that? Yeah, <laughs> I would. Do you want to pay fewer contributions? Yeah, that'd be nice. But, um, you know, and, and they're not meeting in person. So Jim Dinning is obviously a fairly, well, I would say a very well-respected uh, former finance minister and public uh, servant and, and leader um, who, has um, quite frankly tied himself to a bit of a, 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 a sinking ship when it comes to this conversation, I think, you know, and I think that he's been asked to do something um, that he didn't really know what he was getting into. He said, you know, we're going to have a good faith conversation here in our consultations, but they're not meeting Albertans in person. And I think that that's wrong, right? They're controlling the conversation. They're not allowing people to ask questions. And so I'm really happy that the Alberta NDP caucus, Shannon Phillips is doing consultations. We're gonna be doing our own consultations in person as well. And we're gonna gather feedback and hopefully they'll actually listen to us, but we'll see. So here comes AIMCO, the Alberta Investment Management Corporation. Um, how many of you are familiar with this body, generally speaking? Okay, so lots of you, most of you kind of have heard of it. So basically, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the investment corporation that's responsible for investing most of Alberta's pension plans. Um, this is the former CEO. He resigned um, after uh, AIMCO reported that they lost $2.1 billion in volatility markets, investing in very, very dangerous uh, uh, markets, um, fewer than four years ago. Um, so when you talk to people, actuaries and pension experts across the country, it's really important to keep in mind that it matters who's investing our money, as we all know, you know, as, as individuals and, you know, um, as CPP plan members and potentially APP plan members, um, AIMCO is considered to be mediocre at best when it comes to financial management. When the teacher's retirement fund was going to move over, um, uh, there might be some teachers in the room, uh, it was, you know, forced by government and no one really wanted it to happen because people don't really trust AIMCO right now. There's also a rumor out there, I don't know if you've heard it, and it's just a rumor, okay, so don't, don't, don't quote me, but um, they're searching for a new board of AIM, a board chair of AIMCO right now, um, and rumor has it amongst sort of PSPP, public sector pension plan staff and folks, and LAPP, local authorities pension plan folks, that the number one candidate, which will be appointed by an order in council by the provincial government, um, is none other than Stephen Harper. Oh. Yeah, so again, just a rumor. 
Um, how am I doing for time, Christy? 12.30? Okay. I'll go through myths really quickly, and I'd love to just like answer, uh, talk, talk about this a little bit more. But n there's five big myths on the CPP. Myth number one, Albertans are paying more than any other Canadian pensioner in any other province for their pension for CPP. Um, the fact is that all Canadians make contributions at the same rate and draw out on the same formula, except for C or QPP in Quebec, because they have their own plan. So when you hear people say, we're paying four times as much for the Canada Pension Plan as a province, that's not how it works. We all pay individually into the plan, and we all receive benefits from the plan individually, okay? So that's just a myth. I just wanted to bust that. I don't think you all believe that, but um, it's important to arm ourselves with good facts. Myth number two is the issue is mostly a seniors issue, pensioners issue. Um, it's a huge concern for every Canadian, right? We know that the plan's going to be healthy for 75 years to come. I hope that I won't be working for my entire life. Um, I would like to retire one day. I can tell you that conversations with our members at PIA who are under the age of 40 are a little bit more focused on things like the environment, right? Or a little bit fo more focused on climate security and things like that, job security itself. But I can tell you, more and more people, even if they aren't retired today, are very concerned about the CPP not being there for them as well. So it's not just a seniors issue. Number three, the CPP won't be around for very long. So there was that conversation I mentioned in the mid-90s that resulted in the changes to the plan in 1997. Um, and that myth persists to this day. But the CPP is as safe and reliable as any other financial structure. It's rated as one of the safest and top performing plans in the world. Um, when it comes to pension plans in the world um, by our own actuary, um, by independent actuaries, and also by independent bodies who rate pension plans. So that's also a myth. Of course, any human-made program or structure uh, is, you know, bound to be imperfect, but as far as these things go, it's as safe as any pension plan you can come by. Myth number four, Quebec left the CPP and they're doing better for it. I hear this all the time. Quebec never left the CPP. They were never in the CPP. They were in the midst of a very, very interesting and hard national question in the 60s, as many of us you know, know, um, and they chose not to join the CPP. Um, and their pension, I mean, no shade to the Quebec pension plan, <laughs> but it is smaller and it's more susceptible to volatility, and that's an important factor for us here because we'll have far fewer contributors to our pension plan than the Canada pension plan, and even smaller than Quebec. Number five, and this is my favorite one, is that Alberta is entired, entitled to over half of CPP's assets to the tune of $334 billion. No. <laughs> it's not true. We talked a bit about that, and I'm sure that you all, you all have some comments on that too. Um, so what can we do? The real reason why I'm here today, other than to hang out with Christy and my other friends, is to um, encourage you to take action. We are an advocacy organization. It's not enough for us to sit here and just talk amongst ourselves where we all agree. We need to organize and build power to make sure this doesn't move forward. So if you like QR codes, you can scan that one. Um, I'll leave it up there for a little bit. We have four actions on our website. So the number one is that you can print our petition, our formal petition that we will deliver to the legislature, hand off to the opposition critic for finance, and get her to table it for us. We also have a digital action, so you can send a letter today, this minute, that we've pre-written for you to send to the finance minister, the premier, and also your local MLA by postal code. And then we also have three fact sheets that I would really encourage you to read and print if you can, and just distribute them. Whether you're having coffee at the coffee shop or you're hanging out you know, at home with your friends and your family, just please keep spreading the word. We have three fact sheets. They're really, really good information by people who have worked in the sector for a long time. And finally, um, I have kind of, uh, uh, this is a big ask. Uh, I want to join you all for coffee <laughs> next time I'm down, or I can come by Zoom or one of us from PIA can come. So if you have six or more people or even a couple, um, you basically want to do a coffee party, and I think this is really the way to you know, change things. It, 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 it's, it's all about conversations. And so if you have a few people, you can have a host, you know, someone whose house it is. A speaker can be yourself, or you know, someone can come down from PIA, and then invite your guests. Have a simple agenda. Introductions, guest speaker for 10 minutes, not as long as me. Um, and do a round table, have a conversation about next steps. What can you do? Are you gonna meet with Newdorf down the road in Lethbridge East? Are you gonna go to the legislature and have a rally? Are you just gonna make sure everyone gets the fact sheets? Pick one simple action and then have coffee and light, light snacks. Um, 
and then just have someone to take notes. So coffee parties are a great way to organize and mobilize, and I would just encourage you guys to do that. Um, so those are my big asks. Um, and that's a little bit about the CPP and how it's under threat and what we can do to save it. So thanks so much for having me. I look forward to talking. Uh, our next week's topic will be uh, speaker Ross Gilgore, and they will be speaking on the topic, are changes needed to the Lethbridge existing land use bylaw? So we ask those who are wanting to ask questions, please line up along the wall here. Please state your name and your question briefly. No long pause preludes or stories, please. We ex uh, expect respectful and polite full discourse. If you do prefer to write your question, uh, do so legibly, and I will uh, ask the question myself. So uh, for those who'd like to ask questions, please come on up. Gail McMartin, would you please comment on the legalities of some of the CPP? For example, if a province chooses to leave the CPP, my understanding in reading the website is you don't get back in. Secondly, um, if people want, if, if Alberta wants to leave, for example, what do the other provinces have to say? I'm under, again, reading the website. Two-thirds of the provinces in this country need to agree. That will never happen. So why are we wasting money? Right. Good questions. Um, thank you for the questions. Those are both very, very important questions from a sort of legal, technical standpoint. Did everyone hear the questions? Yeah. Um, so number one is that you're right. If we if we leave the CPP, we're out of the CPP. Um, Christia Freeland uh, wrote a letter yesterday to the premier stating that very, very emphatically. The decision is irreversible. Once we're out, we're out. Number two, my understanding based on our conversations with the CPP Investment Board is we don't have to have two-thirds of the provinces support this. Under the Act, we are allowed to start our own pension plan, but it has to be comparable to the CPP in terms of contributions, benefits, and other features. That's my understanding. But who's going to enforce that then? Who's going to enforce that? <laughs> Daniel Smith, I guess. The ra I mean, it's up to us, I suppose, but in, in all seriousness, that's the risk. I mean, the legislation says that it has to be the same, essentially. There's no guarantee that it'll be the same. Yeah. Well, to start with, that was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. And uh, my question is kind of off the topic here, but can Closer? Okay. I don't want to bite it. <laughs> anyway, my question is a little off-sided because uh, I've uh, just recently read a very good uh, letter to the editor in the Lethbridge Herald with regards to the Canada Pension Plan, and it was written by uh, David Carpenter, who's an, who's an accountant and various held lots of positions, and his, his argument is simple, that uh, he tried to contact LifeWorks. They have no phone number, no address, no email address, and uh, so who are they, and who, what authority do they have as, uh, you know, uh, about, you know, the credibility to write a report like this? Yep. So that's my question. <laughs> Can you answer it? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. That's a great question. And what's your, what's your name? Tom McLeod. Tom McLeod. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, LifeWorks wrote that report. They used to be Morneau Chappelle. Um, they're owned by TELUS now. Uh, TELUS, the, yeah, TELUS. Um, and um, they are also registered lobbyists within Alberta, and they could be, you know, considered pension administrators potentially. And they also have a stake in, you know, developing telehealth and privatized health solutions. So there's a lot of concern about the, at least, perception and real conflict of interest there. I also noticed on the report when it was published, they erased the name of the person. You always have a top letter on those reports. I don't know if anybody looked at it, but they, 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 they blanked out the name of the person from LifeWorks. And we have also heard that LifeWorks has contacted the Ministry of Finance and the Premier's office saying they don't appreciate how the report is being um, used. 
by the provincial government and they're getting a lot of flack as well. So it's a very good question and it's a very, it's a very real concern for people. Yeah. Somebody's pretty tall around here. Uh, Terry Shellington is my name, and thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Uh, I have two quick questions. Uh, one is, uh, I'm wondering what the political payoff is for, for Daniel Smith on this. The polls suggest that this is an uphill climb, and uh, so maybe I'm missing something, but wh where's the payoff? Uh, the base may be pleased, but, uh, but elections are won on the basis of the middle. Uh, anyway, that's one question. Secondly, uh, David Carpenter in his article a couple of days ago suggested that there would be a $5,000 bonus for all Albertans when the transfer was made. That figure 5,000 was in his article. Um, did he make that up? I'm wondering how that could be legally possible because that the, 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 the revenue and the resources of the, can, of the pension plan belong to the workers and the people who paid into it, not to every Albertan. So I'm wondering how that could be possibly legal, uh, or is there any protection for slobs like me who, who paid into it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, the, on, the, on the second question, I'll have to read that op-ed. I haven't seen it yet. I just got into town today. My understanding is that they can't just pay you know, direct dividends out from the CPP contributions that we transfer from the assets. That would be my interpretation of what I've seen from that asset transfer clause within the Act. Um, the broader picture, though, is that the government of Alberta said, yeah, it's going to take up to $2 billion to stand up this pension plan, you know, financial management services, the rest of it, all the infrastructure, but that at the end of the day, contribution rates will be lower and uh, benefits will be higher. I, I, I don't believe that based on conversations we've had with pension experts. As far as a direct sort of, you know, Danny Buck situation, though, I'd be, I, I don't, I haven't heard anyone talking about that being possible. Um, on your first question, you remind me, we were asking about... Um, oh, I, I mean, it might be a smokescreen, right? Like, we're talking every day uh, amongst ourselves in our, in our task force and our working group. It's like, this dog doesn't seem like it's going to hunt, right? Like, this seems like a big loser of, of an idea. I mean, I don't know who you're talking to, but I'm talking to people who are just like, I can't believe that she's, she's going after this. So it could be that it's just another opportunity to rally up the base, to pick a fight with Ottawa, and they won't even go to the referendum. For me and for P Public Interest Alberta, we sat down and said, you know what, for us, we don't want to leave it to chance. We don't think this should go to a referendum. There's also a broader picture here that if you drive people to the referendum in the municipal elections and they have the same ballot, there's also going to be some interesting mischief, I would call it, at the ballot box when it comes to slates that are running on right-wing populist agendas. And that is a concern for us as well because referenda, they're often used to mobilize, you know, certain demographics and bases of, of voters for, you know, for political ends. And um, we've heard Take Back Alberta say that they're very interested in school boards and they're very interested in, 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 in city council elections as well. So, um, yeah. Hi, Brad. My, my name is Henning Mundell. I got a letter from you the other day because I wrote to the minister uh, and uh, with copies and so on about my disgust about this plan. But my question is actually now sort of a follow-up on what you ju just got. Um, Danielle Smith did not campaign in 2023 on this, although she had raised it earlier, but she didn't. And I, uh, you listened to or heard the uh, speech from the throne. Apparently, she didn't mention it in the speech from the throne. My question is, is she just being cagey or is she starting to backpedal? <laughs> Uh, that's that's a good question. Yeah, she didn't mention it at all in the throne speech. I think she's being cagey and she's backpedaling. <laughs> I think she's afraid of this proposal and she knows that it's not very popular and she wants to back away from it. But she might also not want to talk about it for the next several months and then stick it into a referendum. So we need to make sure that we're making elected officials talk about it because, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a slippery issue and you can tell they really don't want it to be front and center. Hi, my name is Bob Petrushowski. I just returned to Alberta three years ago and I retired with my wife. And one of my concerns is the portability aspect. Uh, everyone, not everyone, but a large number of people I meet 
aren't from Alberta, have come back to Alberta or aren't from Alberta, Ontario, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, BC. Now, one of the concerns I have, and my wife and I have talked about it, if this came into being and there was no portability guarantee, we would leave Alberta. Right. So, is there, have they talked about how this portability is going to work? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, they haven't a lot. They were pressed on it when they announced their report release and they had the report release and what I heard the Premier say is that, listen, it's going to be just like the Canada Pension Plan, therefore it's going to have a portability feature. And they're like, okay, well how is that going to work? How are you going to ensure that? And they just said, we're going to make it happen. So there's a lot of, there's not enough detail there. Um, that's a major concern. I'd say that's the number one or two concern that people have because Alberta is a commuter province, right? Like people come work here for a few years, move back or retire and go to BC or what have you, right? There's a lot of people coming and going in this province. That's what makes it great. But if you can't take your pension with you or there's questions about whether you can, I just don't think the risk is worth it. So yeah, that's a really, that's a real ongoing concern and we haven't heard enough from the premier on that issue at all. Uh, thanks, Brad, for a very fine talk. My name is Jim Tagg. I actually have two questions, I guess. Uh, first of all, uh, looking at the uh, audience, I would estimate that more than half of us are collecting CPP rather than paying into it. Uh, and I assume as well, we are all grandfathered into the Canadian Pension Plan and are not part of this, would not be part of this. The second one is, what are the mathematics involved in deriving $334 billion as being our rightful share? This must involve uh, permutations on, uh, of, of, of an outrageous sort. And if you do know any of that, I'd like to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, so I'm not an actuary, but but what we've heard from the LifeWorks report is that the interpretation of that asset transfer clause is based on um, a projection of what Albertan uh, contributors over the lifetime of the, the plan up to 2027, which is when they're saying we would likely pull out and set up the plan, um, what those contributions could have based on their projections earned in the market over the lifetime of those investments. So uh, it's, it's about hypothetically what we could have earned on our own through a plan if we were to have it on our own in the first place. Which, I mean, you know, Albertans, we're smart, but uh, you know, uh, maybe we're lucky too. I mean, 53%, if you look at 53% of the asset pool and then you add up if BC and Ontario had a similar report or they're reading the news and they're like, why don't we do the same thing here? That seems pretty smart. That would add up to over 125% of the total current asset pool of the CPP. It would cease to exist and other provinces would be out of pocket. Billions of dollars. It, it, most people just think it's absolutely not credible, but that's kind of how the interpretation works. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't, I haven't heard Daniel Smith speak on it directly, but I've heard the finance minister say in you know talk radio that um, I don't want to misquote him here, but I, you know he didn't really have a good answer for that. So I'll have to get. I can get back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Carolyn Langford, uh, just a, a brief anecdotal uh, comment with respect to portability. I worked for three, four years in uh, Quebec, paid into the Quebec pension plan. When I moved back to Ontario, my invested money slid very seamlessly into CPP. So I assume that the functions are there for, for portability. Good. Hi, my name's uh, Tom Moffat, and um, just a question about, uh, you, you've been talking to some pension um, experts, and I was wondering if uh, they had said anything about how complex it would be to try and uh, determine uh, where your pension contributions came from. So I'm wondering if, uh, in an Alberta pension plan, they would say, well, you worked, like me, 
a bunch of years in Ontario, a bunch of years in Manitoba, a bunch of years in British Columbia. So all of those go to CPP, and the years you were in Alberta go to an APP. Uh, so is, has there been any talk about how they might handle those types of things? Um, I have, and the short answer is I, ha I haven't heard any, but that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, you'd have to, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's a real concern for me too, right? So I've worked in other provinces before, and I don't know if it'd be transferred over. Yeah, you know, if people have worked in other provinces, whether the portability of the contributions works as well. Um, so if you've moved from another province over, you know, your lifetime as a worker, and whether you, that would go into the Alberta Pension Plan, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that the idea is that under the CPP Act, that in setting up your own plan as an alternative, you have to be able to transfer existing uh, contribution uh, uh, payers into the new plan and keep them whole um, is the idea. So they would be bound by that act at a high level. Um, but I mean, administratively, uh, very complex. So yeah. Yeah. Hi. My question is, if the rules, oh, Colleen, if the rules are such uh, governing the leaving of the CPP that um, the government can't use that money that we contribute, is that, do those rules also encompass that? So if we have to mimic the CPP, if we were to leave it, does that include the monies do not become a slush fund for right. the Alberta government. Right, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Colleen. That's a really good question. And the the answer to that is that the rules governing how the CPP will be, in, or the APP will be invested, will not be governed by the same investment board rules as the CPP, as a rule. That's not part of the requirements. When you look at the QPP, for example, some people like this, some people don't. But the Quebec government, they don't directly direct investment decisions, but within the terms of reference of the board, they are able to make decisions to invest directly in Quebec, uh, for example, just because it's going to be good for Quebec's economic futures. I don't know exactly what the language is, but they do make investment decisions that are beyond the general and very strict uh, guidelines of maximizing returns for ratepayers, which is what the CPP has. Alberta could definitely change that, and it could mean investments in Alberta projects, I mean, it's debatable, of course, whether or not that's a good or bad thing, um, but it would be, in my opinion, much more likely that Alberta pension plan contributions would be more susceptible to political influence from the provincial government. Um, I guess my question is this. Oh, Frank Isaac. I guess my question is this, uh, why are we believing this report, this frameworks in the first place? Why was a private company uh, approached to create this report? I know from experience uh, working at the college that we had contracted a company called Campus Works, okay? And they were all knowing because they were simply from Florida. All right? So they come into the college and they try to rework uh, the computing program. Big waste of money happened there. The college was paying flights for these guys to fly back to Florida. They were paying dry cleaning bills for these guys, these consultants. All right? We don't want to get into that situation, I don't think. I'll give you another example. Um, choice of data sets. How do we know that these are the correct data sets to come to this conclusion? There's no check and balance on this report, and they're, they're believing it right off the bat, okay? These are the numbers. How do you know those are the numbers? Do you know? Does anybody know? They don't. They haven't got this one number, and I wouldn't trust a decision based on one number. I'll give you another example here. My son worked on a report that said the United States was in good shape to battle COVID. <laughs> right? They had the money, they had the infrastructure, the hospitals, everything. 
one problem. Donald Trump didn't figure in the equation. So beware. My question is, how do we believe that the data set is correct? And why are we moving in that direction? Is it because it's what a private company wants? Or is it because what the people want? That's a really good question. And um, I, I think I just want to say three things. The first is we, we don't trust the numbers. Uh, at Public Interest Alberta, um, th thanks for teeing that up. The second is that if you're interested in alternative interpretations, I would really encourage people to look at the stuff that we have authored at PIA, number one. Number two is also check out uh, Trevor Toombs report that he had recently published himself and I think it got reproduced in policy options I believe. Anyway, if you Google Dr. Trevor Toombs out of the University of Calgary, he has a different set of data that he uses to, uh, you know, conclude that uh, contribution rates will be different than what we see in the LifeWorks report and that asset transfer amount will be much different than what we see in the LifeWorks report. So, and I can tell you from experience just anecdotally that oftentimes when governments commission reports, um, you'll notice that they say we've received the report and then you wonder where it goes. It, it goes into a black hole where it's often there's a lot of conversation about what they want to really release of what was in that report originally. And I think that that's probably what's going on with LifeWorks, saying they don't really want to be associated with the politicization of the report. Um, there, I believe that there might have been alternative scenarios that were given, potentially, that weren't, that weren't published, but now I just sound like a conspiracy theorist, so. <laughs> but I would say check out Trevor Toombs stuff for sure. Uh, I'm Mary Shillington, uh, and my um, comment and question is really a prejudiced one, because I don't believe a word that Daniel Smith says. And why should we believe her? How has she proven herself to us uh, uh, that she really cares about Albertans? She cares for her base, but what about the rest of us uh, uh, who are not her base? And uh, yay to uh, Rachel Notley and the protests that are being made. Uh, can you give uh, those of us who don't believe Danielle and aren't going to believe her what we should do? Yeah. Uh. Yeah, for sure. I also don't believe Daniel Smith. I think what you should do is you should join Public Interest Alberta. <laughs> we also have voluntary memberships. Update your SACPA membership if you haven't already. Um, and, and join us in our activities mobilizing Albertans. I really believe that there's a lot of education out there already. People generally seem to be on board with a lot of skepticism that we, we feel. Um, and now it's really the time to make sure that we're connecting with other Albertans who might be believing all those billboards and those signs. You know, yes, it's our pension, it's our choice, but our choice is no, don't leave the CPP, and we need to say that loud and clear. So, thank you. Will you please comment on the composition of the CPP board? I would encourage everybody here to Google CPP and read for yourselves how the board is structured, who appoints the board members. For example, the president or chairman of the board right now is a woman from Alberta, and, they, and every province has input as to who is on the board. This is not run by Trudeau and Freeland, mm -hmm. and that's the narrative that is being uh, promoted here. So please, if you can shed some light on this. Sure. What's your name? Gail? Gail McMartin. Gail McMartin. Thank you, Gail. Um, I don't have much more to add than that. Uh, I will say just a couple of things about the structure and the composition of the board. It is independent from government, and there are provinces. Uh, provinces make recommendations. Those recommendations are, 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 are taken into consideration in the appointments. Now, that provides broad representation from across the province, and it also provides broad representation from different communities within Canada. That's really important in terms of independence. What we have seen when it comes to LAPP and PSPP, um, the appointments, the agency boards and commissions process, uh, recruitment and appointment process in Alberta, 
uh, was reformed quite a lot by the previous NDP government. Um, there were independent processes that were put in place. We had a person right in the Premier's office who was responsible for reforming those processes and structures. But there's still a long way to go. And at the end of the day, it is the cabinet, so the UCP cabinet, Daniel Smith and her ministers, who make direct decisions to appoint anyone they want to pension boards. So we have an Alberta provincial provincial. So just in terms of the contrast and the potential risk there, there's much more political risk when it comes to appointments of pension plan uh, board of directors in an Alberta plan than there is in a Canada pension plan. Um, and that's, that's scary. One more question? Sure. Cylinder? We don't. <laughs> It's okay. Um, I'm Patricia Boswell. This, quite honestly, is more of a, a, not a direct question to what you've been doing, but I'm, as a, an immigrant, 60 years ago, I came to Canada, and, and I've been to every province, and I am really concerned about how much the antagonism Danielle Smith is taking to Ottawa will affect the way other provinces will be looking at us. Have you had any feedback on that kind of thing at all? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm also concerned about the perception of Alberta in Canada. I have been for a long time as a born and raised Albertan. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we, you know, I get made fun of a lot for being a cowboy, even though I'm, I'm not, obviously, um, for my friends in Ontario. So there is that sort of like general perception. It's mostly uh, fun and games. But I think when it comes to this issue, um, there's a couple things I wanted to say to your question because it makes me think a lot about the interventions made by other provinces and the federal government. And I think politically it's a little bit dangerous. So I just want to say I think it's good that we have the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister federally saying, here's how we see the risk to the Canada Pension Plan for all Canadians, not just Albertans. Um, politically on the ground here though, I'm not sure that that's a very strategic move um, for for us, um, and I think that any campaign that we have on the Alberta Pension Plan um, and our opposition to it needs to be led by Albertans, it needs to be led by the opposition in the legislature, it needs to be led by organizations like SACPA and PIA, because I think that we have much more opportunity to convince our friends and neighbors if we say we're Canadians and we're Albertans and we're members of the CPP, we care about it, we don't want to leave it, we don't want to put it at risk, rather than having an even more deeply unpopular Prime Minister in Alberta than he ever has been say, you know, we think Alberta's stupid, essentially. Which, you know, anyway. But, so I think that, you know, I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I am concerned about that. There's always that antagonism. And the UCP really make hay out of it. I mean, it's the base of their politics, right? They'd rather talk about Ottawa and made up problems than talk about seniors care, health care, education, age, income supports, housing in Alberta. I listened to the throne speech and they're like, oh my gosh, utilities have gone up so much in the last few years, someone should do something about it. And you're like, wait a minute, this is a speech from the throne from the UCP government. But the Ottawa kind of <sighs> distraction is, is really effective, right, for their base. So. Great. Sorry, you are tall. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Brad, for your joining. I just want you to comment on one thing before you go, your take-home message. But I want to ask, and it hasn't been touched on, how many taxpayer resources do you think are going into this campaign, and, and, and what can we do to maybe you know, stop that? Yeah. And then take-home message, and I'll let you wrap up. Sure. Um, thanks, Christy. Uh, so on uh, the amount of resources, I was driving down this morning from Edmonton, so I left at about 6 in the morning, and I was near Red, Red Deer, south of Red Deer. I saw five billboards within like 500 meters. Three of them were for the, we don't want to freeze in the cold when it's minus 30, tell the feds campaign. Has anyone seen that one? It's all black and white. And two of them were for your pension, your choice, within like on electronic billboards within 500 meters. So we have heard and we've seen that the government has confirmed they're spending at least $7.5 million on the pension campaign alone. And then when it comes to the Tell the Feds campaign, which is all about the carbon tax and how it's affecting home heating fuel and we want the same deal as Atlantic Canada, that's a different debate. But in terms of the advertising, it's on the TC, TTC in Toronto. It's in Ottawa. Um, it's across the country, right? And so what 
you see is the provincial government, not the UCP, but the provincial government with our tax dollars campaigning against Justin Trudeau on behalf of Pierre Polyev to the tune of millions of dollars. I don't know how much that second campaign is worth, but it's probably millions as well. Eight, Eight million? Oh, there you go. So over $15 million is being spent on these two campaigns, right? One we don't even want to talk about, the other that's not really about us, but it's about the federal election. It's ridiculous. Um, in terms of takeaway messages, um, I see you all as leaders in your own community. You are the activists who are going to make the difference on whether or not we save the CPP. So I want to thank SACPA and I want to thank you all for listening to me. Hopefully it wasn't too rambly um, and, uh, you know, not too many jokes. but. I, I really appreciate you all being here, and I mean it when I say that if you want to have a conversation by Zoom or if you want to invite me down in person to come meet with your other organizations, I'm happy to do that. I really believe that when it comes to organizing and stopping this thing, it's about community power. It's not about ads on billboards, and we can do it if we stick together. So thanks very much. Thank